Mary Ellen, we've been together now for four years in an extraordinary conversation with legal philosophers, theologians, ethicists on international law. But your colleagues in your field as a distinguished international lawyer, your colleagues would say to you, keep religion out of international law. That's why we started this business. How would you respond to that from your colleagues? Right. Um, well, I used to keep religion out of international law. That is the dominant view, and I was part of it until I began meeting with this incredible group, and we all realized that religion is at the beginning of international law. It's in its origins, and we've never lost it. And many of us, people of faith, have tried to bring our faith commitments in various ways into international law. And one of the things I gained through our group CTI and our International Law and Religion group is that it's time now to bring that to the surface and be more uh, outspoken, more honest really about the role of, of religion in present day international law. What are the kinds of crises that international law is facing that would prompt you to be bolder perhaps uh, both as a scholar and as a Christian in relating uh, these two key elements in your life, your faith uh, and your passion about international law. Well, you gathered us together um, in conjunction with a conference here at Princeton on, to, on the torture scandal and what we as people of faith should be doing in response to this terrible moment in our country's history. But torture is not the only problem. We are facing a world that is suffering terrible poverty, terrible environmental breakdown, war and other kinds of human rights abuse around the world and the threat of course of nuclear weapons and universal annihilation these are all issues that international law should be grappling with but is is limited it doesn't it has it's lost its vision and its moral compass i think because of this idea that you had to suppress any sense of a connection to deeper moral um, uh, impulses and uh, ways of reasoning and uh, inspirations that um, used to be very much part of international law. So I think our diagnosis, really this isn't my thinking alone, but through our group at CTI, we collectively came to understand that one of the limiting factors of today's international law and why it seems to be so underprepared to deal with these momentous crises in the world is because we've lost our understanding deeply of what international law is, where it came from and where it can go. What have you gained from the theologians in this conversation? Well, the theologians have been incomparable. They, um, w I might have been aware, for example, that one of the early inspirations for the idea of human dignity that we find throughout international human rights law was the idea of the Imago Dei from Genesis. Our wonderful theologians meeting in our group were able to say, Yes, there was that inspiration, but the Imago Dei is a rich concept throughout the Bible, and there's been incredible theological work done on that concept that can really inform international lawyers of what the concept of human dignity has grown to mean and should mean in our practice and our development of international law. This notion that we are all made, all human beings are made in the image and likeness of God is fundamental to the Christian tradition that has been the focus of our working group on theology and international law. But international law obviously concerns all of humanity and humanity in its different religious traditions. Do you think this, this notion can also be common ground for people of other faiths? Well, it, it, it has. Imago Dei is a concept that's understood by all people who read and respect Genesis, so Muslims as well as Jews. But what I came to learn through the group is that um, in Christian theology there's a particularly rich understanding of the Imago Dei that goes into the New Testament and we talked about also the Imago Christi or the Imago Dei of the New Testament which is particularly Christian. The thing that this group has helped us to do, um, so international lawyers and religious people parted ways at the end of the Second World War with the rise of positivism and a rejection of any natural law or um, connections to other uh, disciplines or other ways of knowing, and particularly the religious way of knowing. And um, that was for understandable reasons, because we wanted to create an international law that all people in a diverse world that was increasingly global could participate in. And there was a sense that if we brought our religious, our various religious views to bear, 
we couldn't have this universal law. Now, 60 years after that compromise was made or that parting of the ways was made, we've also seen that we can't do international law without religion. And what our group has said is we have particular religious resources to bring to bear, and we need to think about ways that we can have international law with the contribution of religion, not only from Christianity, but how we Christians can work with people from other religious groups in this common space we call international law. So it's been an incredibly empowering work for uh, me as a Christian, but also as an international lawyer. I think we, uh, we're on a road now, our group, where we can continue to enrich international law, but also the lives of each of us as Christians who've been participating.